Hello, welcome to the Friday, January 18th, 2019 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Trend Micro came across an interesting malicious application in Google's Play Store that masked itself as a battery saver application. Now, it appears to me that battery saver applications are sort of uh, one of those favorites uh, to actually hide malware, probably because they don't really do much uh, visibly to the user if they do anything. Now, in this particular case, the developer of the malware actually jumped through some additional hoops to make it more difficult to detect that malware is running. The malware will only run if the phone is being moved. Now, Trent Micro's assumption here is that the reason for this is that uh, if the malware is running in a sandbox, so someone is trying to analyze it, then typically there are no motion sensors or if motion sensors are emulated by the sandbox, then they're stationary. There is no motion being simulated. So as a result, this particular malware will only run while the phone is being moved. Now, once the malicious code actually gets to run, it will then create a pop-up offering a system update. So this is how then the actual banking malware is being installed on the phone with the sufficient privileges, of course, to have access to the system. Now, about 5,000 users downloaded this particular malware. The vast majority of the victims happened to be in Japan. And Twitter fixed a five-year-old vulnerability in its Android app that may have exposed protected tweets. Now, in Twitter, you have the option to send protected tweets, which are limited. Not everybody can see them. People to have to actually follow you in order to see the tweets. And with that, you can sort of create essentially more private tweets. Well, the problem here was that if you set your tweets to protected, but then you made any other change uh, to your Twitter profile via the app, like for example, changing your email address, this would then flip the protected switch and turn your tweets unprotected. Again, this happened for the last five years. Nobody apparently has noticed so far. I don't think uh, people trust protected tweets too much, which is a good idea. I don't think Twitter really was designed to be sort of a private communication medium. And if you're looking for something to read, something to do and play with over the weekend, Ackerman Jury has published a real nice blog post with some of the basics behind WebAuth and, and Fido2. The big thing about uh, these authentication mechanisms is uh, that they really try to replace passwords instead of augment them like uh, traditional uh, two-factor authentication. And they really try to probably address the largest issue that we have these days with authentication and that's phishing. And uh, even uh, two-factor authentications of the classic uh, token authentication has shown to be not really phishing resistant because a user could always enter their token value into a phishing site and then that phishing site can turn around and use it. The difference with FIDO2 and WebAuthn is that it's really based on a hardware token that does the checking for you, what website you connect to, and it will only send credentials to that website that it used with that website before. So really the user is sort of taken out of the loop here and it's up to the system to actually verify which website you connect to and that tends to be a lot more reliable. I would hope that websites really pick up and offer this as an option. We don't have it quite yet on the Internet Storm Center website. Well, uh, maybe after this weekend, depends on how much time I have to actually uh, play with that and experiment uh, with it. Probably the part that holds it back the most is that you do need a hardware authenticator in order to use it. YubiKey is probably the most popular implementation at this point, but only their very latest and greatest version of their authenticator does actually support FIDO2 and WebAuthn. 
And well, if you ever wanted to increase your income by creating some ransomware and sending it uh, to your friends, uh, but you didn't really have the skills to create the ransomware and run the back end, uh, like all the key distribution and collecting the bitcoins and such, well, uh, there's a solution for you now, and that's ransomware as a service. An Iranian group offers uh, this as a service uh, based around the Black Rat Trojan. All you have to do is find victims that actually will install it, uh, but they will create the ransomware and create the backend, and they will keep 20% of the earnings for their troubles. This is a trend that's sort of common in other malware types too, where you have different groups that sort of specialize in certain parts of the malware delivery chain. They either write the malware, they create ads in order to distribute the malware or have other means to actually spread the malware, or then of course others that have the ability to actually cash out any cryptocurrencies or other money uh, being earned by the malicious software. Well, uh, that's it for today. I also published via Twitter another packet. Uh, so something else for you to do over the weekend. I'll post the solution probably on Monday. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.